Thank you very much. You know, uh, the last series that I did, I told you last night I'm doing a new series here called The Battle for Truth, but I, I did another new series a few weeks ago in Boston, uh, and, and uh, that one was also uh, on, on spiritual warfare. That, that was called Surrender is Not an Option, and I talked about how uh, individuals and especially families uh, can fight the good fight in this spiritual warfare and one of the best ways actually the only way uh, is you have to be in a state of grace I remember when I was in the army one of the trainers said to us in his own sweet way <laughs> as only they can do the guy with the smoky bear hat, you know, drill instructor. Uh, he said, ladies, <laughs> if you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight? And he was talking about physical training. If you can't even get to the battlefield, in other words, if you're not in good enough physical condition to make it to the battlefield, you might have to march 20 miles, 30 miles, over mountains, through swamps. You have to be in good physical condition. If you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight? Well, I can use that as an analogy. It fits perfectly. And say to you, if you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight? You must be in a state of grace to fight the good fight. You don't even get on the battlefield unless you're in a state of grace. That's where confession comes in. We're all sinners, we know that, uh, but we have a wonderful gift from God in the sacrament of reconciliation or penance, and uh, we should use it. Go to confession. You know, some, some of us maybe haven't been to confession in many, many years. Uh, please, go to confession, this Lent especially. Don't wait. Don't wait. Uh, I, I, I ran into someone one time, they said, well, I'm just waiting for the right priest. <laughs> she was 84. <laughs> Don't wait any longer. <laughs> Get with it. Okay. We have a lot of material to cover in a very short period of time. I'm going to rather rushed uh, to get through uh, as much as I can. We talked about the church as the guardian and teacher of truth last night. It is the church founded upon the rock who is Christ but who grafted Peter into himself. The church is the only authentic and authoritative interpreter of truth, the Word of God. Uh, God gives a special charism to the church through her magisterium. The word magisterium means teaching office. And that's the Pope with the bishops united to him teaching what Jesus taught to the apostles from the beginning. The church and the church alone recognizes the face of Christ. All kinds of people think they know Jesus. They have all kinds of ideas, sometimes conflicting and contradictory ideas about who Jesus is. I talked to you about the passage last night in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, uh, where Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And then you got conflicting responses. Oh, some, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the other prophets. Who do you say that I am? And one got it right, only one. Peter, Simon. Simon got it right. You are the Christ, the anointed one, son of the living God. And Jesus named Peter his vicar. When Peter speaks in matters of faith and morals, meaning when the Pope speaks in matters of faith and morals, that's Jesus speaking through him in definitive matters of faith and morals. Most of the trouble, I would say all of the real trouble in the world is because inside of the church we have frequently failed or refused to get it right. 
We have to get it right inside the church. We have to be obedient and humble and accept the teaching of the church. You know, people who just accept what they want to accept aren't exercising faith. They're not being faithful to God. Uh, it's not God's word that motivates them. It's their own opinion. Uh, St. Augustine was very clear about that. You know, if you only believe what you want to believe, that's not faith. Now, if I ask you a serious question, I know you're all good Christians and Catholics, and I know you've studied your faith. You all have your copies of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You, you watch my series on Sunday night on EWTN. And so you... You, you, you try to learn your faith. So if I said, what is the theological virtue of faith? Now remember, you know, here's a basic thing. This is a no-brainer, as they say, but it, go, it just goes over most people's heads. Whatever the discipline in life, whether it's physics, whether it's medicine, law, whatever it is, it, in order to be competent in that area, you have to know a certain body of knowledge. You can't just assume it. Um, same thing with the faith. Uh, we ought to know, we ought to have answers for questions. There's only one way to educate people. Uh, it has to be outcome oriented. If I have a class of second graders or high school students or university students, adults, whatever it may be, and I have the responsibility to teach them certain things, the only way I'm going to know if I was effective is by testing them. You have to have answers to questions. If you don't, you don't know. And, and there's a problem with that. So if I said, now you would all admit faith in our religion, faith is important. So it would be a relevant question if I asked you, most of, you, most of you are adults. You should know your faith. If I said, what is the theological virtue of faith? That's a simple question, actually. Would you have an answer? Now just quietly ask yourself, can I answer the question? What is the theological virtue of faith? Now I know, being good Catholics, you would all get this, and there aren't more than three of you in here who couldn't get that question. So for the sake of the three, <laughs> faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief, because he who revealed it is truth itself. You see, I asked a question, what is the theological virtue of faith? The question demands an answer, and I gave you the answer. That's the way you should be with matters of faith. You don't have to be a theologian, and you don't have to have complicated responses. It's very simple. This is not rocket science. You can do this. Everyone can do this. But you see, it's the church who recognizes the face of Christ. It's the church which teaches the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith. It's the church and the church alone who's the authentic and authoritative teacher of truth. Now, the Pope and the bishops united to him. That's the magisterium. They must teach the same truth that Jesus taught in its essence. No Pope, no bishop has the authority to make an essential change in the doctrine of the faith. So, if a bishop or a pope would someday say something like, well, Mary wasn't really immaculately conceived, no, wrong, you can't do that. He, you can't change the definitive teaching of the church, okay? But you have to know where the lines are, you have to know what's doctrine and what's discipline. There's a difference, okay? Uh, eating meat on Friday or not is a discipline. Celebrating Mass in Latin or not, that's a discipline. That's not doctrine. However beautiful the language may be, that's not a doctrinal matter. There are a lot of false teachers that have come along. 
and they attack the flock with plausible, plausible arguments. In other words, the arguments sound good, but they're really not. I have been uh, criticized and condemned uh, by both extremes, liberal and conservative. You know, the ultra-liberals and the ultra-traditionalist conservatives both condemn me, and I'm thankful for it. Because that proves to me I must be doing something right, if they don't like it. You know, books have come out. Uh, that I, I read one that says uh, Mother Teresa shouldn't be a saint because she went against the teaching of the church. Baloney. Baloney. These people are so deceived by Satan himself that, that they become a threat. And he'll try to say, oh, because she was uh, um, equally kind to non-Christians, to Buddhists, because she, she cared for them. Well, come on. You know, uh, same thing, a book came out on EWTN, accused EWTN that, oh, they're not as Catholic as they used to be, you know, it, they're, they're, uh, their teaching is not solid. Not true. Not true. Watch out. I tell people this. Be careful. You can fall off the boat, port or starboard, left or right. Either way, you're in the water with the sharks. <laughs> Stay on the boat. Stay on the bark of Peter. Stay with the Holy Father. Stay with the Holy Father and the bishops united to him in their teaching in faith and morals. You won't go wrong if you do that. I know sometimes there's a temptation. Uh, I get upset, impatient, angry sometimes. You know, all of the recent popes were saintly men. You know, that John Paul will surely be canonized. Now, the anniversary of his passing is tomorrow. And, and so we'll, we'll try to recall uh, John Paul. Most of my preaching, uh, in one way or another, uh, is touched by John Paul's teaching. Uh, like all of us, he was our teacher, a brilliant teacher, a very holy man. Uh, and, and this, uh, I have his encyclical, which is part of the, the uh, substance of the material I'm presenting, his, his great uh, encyclical, The Splendor of Truth, Veritati Splendor, uh, a magnificent document. So, Jesus, the truth, is given to us as a gift by the Heavenly Father. The truth equals Jesus. The truth equals the Word, the Word of God. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, His only word, Jesus. He has no more to say. That summarizes the transmission of truth. That's the beautiful saying of St. John of the Cross, a great doctor and saint of the church. One word our Father spoke, Jesus. Jesus is the eternal word, the only word. He is the truth. Now, how did God convey to us this truth, Jesus, in a way that we could understand? In this segment, I'm going to talk about divine revelation. And what it is, don't, don't ever be confused or put off uh, by terminology or words. You don't have to be. Uh, it's not that complicated. Divine revelation. Now, that's a technical term. What does it mean? It's very simple. God our Father revealed himself to us in the person of his Son. That's the ultimate divine revelation. Um, God revealed himself to us in, in, um, in imperfect ways before, ways we couldn't quite understand, but we did understand some of through nature, right? Uh, you go out in nature, you see the beauty of nature, uh, and your, your mind can be lifted to God. You know, the ordering of the universe, even a scientist such as Einstein, who started out as an unbeliever, uh, ended up concluding that there must be a God. There has to be a prime mover, 
a first cause of all things. Uh, he was a truly scientific man. See, by, by engaging in uh, empirical science, his mind uh, was raised higher and higher and higher until finally he, he said, look, there has to be a God. The universe is too ordered, too perfect, too beautiful for there not to be a God. That's authentic science. So, divine revelation. Let me read to you from the gospel, the prologue of the gospel of John. Beautiful words. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were created through him, and without him nothing that was created was created. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the Father's Word. Whoever has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. It's Jesus that reveals the Father to us. He is the truth. He is the light. Very often in the language of faith, when we talk about light, we're talking about truth. Okay? The light of the world is Jesus. Jesus equals truth. That truth illumines your intellect. Most of the world walks in darkness. Their mind not illuminated by the light of truth, not able to discern that well what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. We need the light of Christ to make these discernments, these decisions. The darkness, however, in the end, the darkness could not, cannot, and will not overcome the light. All right, that's our hope. Now, yes, things seem to be pretty dark right now. You look around the world, and, and uh, things are pretty dark. All kinds of, of uh, moral darkness, deception, lies, evil, uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, prostitution, pornography, abortion, wars, here, there, everywhere. It's frightening. The darkness grows deeper by the day. I want you to remember this, however, please remember this. No matter how dark the night sky grows, the darker the night sky is, the brighter the stars of heaven shine. And you are those stars. You are called to shine with the light of Christ. You have to reflect that beautiful light the splendor of truth, who is Jesus himself. What we're talking about here is not a philosophical abstraction, not a theological abstraction. It is hard to love an abstraction. A lot easier to love a person. And so when we're teaching the faith, when we're teaching the truth, we're not engaged in a dull, dry, academic exercise. What are we teaching? We're teaching Jesus. That's what you teach when you teach the faith. That's what you learn when you learn the faith. It's Jesus. Jesus equals the truth. I love the truth. The truth is worth teaching and the truth is worth defending. We have to do that. The And, and in one way or another, we're all teachers. But you can't give what you don't have. You cannot hand on to your children what you yourself do not have. Most of us are pitifully unqualified to teach the faith. And no matter how good you are at it, you can get better. Okay, whether you're 8 or 80, you can do it. You are called to do this. Learn your faith, love your faith, radiate your faith. There's an old saying in Latin, nemo dat quod non habit. You can't give what you do not have. 
You have to be filled with Jesus to give Jesus to others. That's just a basic precept of this. This is not rocket science. This is very simple. You know, don't let this go over your head or in one ear and out the other because it's so simple. God, by definition, is pure simplicity, but not to us. We complicate a perfectly simple thing. You know, God is pure intelligibility, pure light by definition. But then when he passes through our intellect, we like to confuse a simple thing. You know, that's very often what so-called scholars do sometimes. And some of the people that pose as theologians, but really aren't. God is pure intelligibility, pure light. You know, sometimes you listen to some of these people or you hear a sermon and, uh, you know, you mean, wow, he must be smart. He understands that. I sure can't. <laughs> no, he's not a good teacher. A good teacher conveys the material to the student. If the students aren't getting it, there's something wrong with the teacher. Uh, that, that's the fact. There are very, very, relatively speaking, very few good teachers. Now, there are some. There are notable exceptions. Great teachers. Great teachers in, in every discipline. There are great teachers of religion. Uh, but on a relative basis, they are few and far between. Now, a, a number of them know the material. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to convey it. Two different things. How do you convey the teaching of the faith? Well, here's the key. You have to become one with the teacher. There's only one teacher, capital T. His name is Jesus. He said, you know, Jesus said it himself. You know, he's a rabbi, the one teacher. Let him work through you. Get out of the way. <laughs> really? Get out of the way. Very often, people get in the way. A teacher should be transparent. What does that mean? Well, a teacher shouldn't be opaque. In other words, egotism should not get in the way. Your sins should not get in the way. In order to shine with the light of Christ, in order for the light of Jesus, the truth, to pass through you to your students, to your family, your friends, and so forth, you have to be pure light. You, in other words, get rid of the sin, especially serious sin first. Get rid of that. And then seek to be as one with Jesus as you can be. In other words, like, like John the Baptist said, uh, I, might, I must decrease so that he might increase. Okay? So Jesus is the teacher. Humility is the key to unlocking the treasure chest of truth. No humility, no holiness. No holiness, no heaven. All of this, what I'm talking about, always circles back and converges at one question. Heaven or hell? Truth or lies? Good or evil? Life or death? Heaven or hell? That's really the only question. Are we going to heaven or are we going to hell? And, and you say, well, um, nobody would want to go to hell. Well. If they knew what it was, I agree with you. But people are easily confused. Uh, most people would not say, I prefer hell. But by their actions, they state that very clearly. You know, by their actions, they say, I don't want God. I don't want heaven. They reject charity. They reject purity. They reject decency. They reject the narrow way and choose the wide way, which leads to destruction, as the Bible says. This is not rocket science. This is very simple. Jesus taught his profound truth to simple fishermen. It wasn't rocket scientists or, or doctoral uh, candidates and, and professors that had this truth revealed to them. Jesus gave it to simple men. You know, fishermen, tax collectors, you know, simple, simple people. It's not rocket science. Simplicity and humility and poverty of spirit, detachment, and so forth, that's necessary. I'll tell you the one and only enemy of truth, arrogance. 
The one and only enemy of truth is hubris, that self-centered pride which seeks to exalt the creature above the Creator. You have to be humble in order to have your eyes opened for truth. That's why, I'll tell you something, after 20 years of experience with this, I can say to you with 100% certainty, it is much easier for me to work with a hell's angel, drug dealer, murderer of a hell's angel, <laughs> than with a Catholic who's been maleducated in Catholic schools and who's gotten the idea that truth is a subjective construct. In other words, whatever they want it to be. Uh, much easier to work with an out-and-out -out pagan sinner than it is to work with an arrogant Catholic who thinks they know something. <laughs> when in fact they don't. It's a kiss of death. That pride is the kiss of death. That, that's the original sin. Pride. You know, uh, the, the original sin basically was, was by the angels. Lucifer. Right? He thought he was the source of his own glory. Lucifer, blinded by his own light. Intellect. Thought he was a smart guy, like my grandma used to say. Too big for your britches. <laughs> that sums it up. Too big for your britches. You know, you, you think you know everything, know it all, right? Hey, if a person knows everything, you can't tell them anything. Very simple. People get all filled up with, with themselves. And no humility. They think they know more than the Pope. You know, the Pope makes formal pronouncements, teaches the truth, and they reject it. In matters of faith, they think they're smarter than the Pope. That is right out of hell. That's right from the devil. And, and you, if you, you've got to get rid of that attitude if you have it. Okay, how does God reveal truth? Well, he revealed it in the person of his son. Well, how do we recognize the son, truly, authentically? The church... The church teaches us about Jesus. Now, there is one word of God, the eternal word, Jesus. Our Heavenly Father reveals Jesus to us in two essential ways. Two essential ways. And they are equal. Equal in importance. Equal in dignity. Now, this is Catholic teaching. Very essential. You'll never get it if you don't get this. Sacred tradition. Sacred scripture. They are equal in importance. Now most of you, and you're good Christians and good Catholics, I know. Most of you don't know what sacred tradition is. If I put it on the exam, would you get it right? If I, if I said to you, what is sacred tradition? It, would you get that right? Most would not get it right. Let me give it to you really simply. Jesus, when he was on the earth, did not write a book. He did not. Now the Bible certainly has God as its primary author. But when Jesus walked in Palestine, when he walked in the Holy Land, he never sat down and wrote a book. Jesus taught orally. Jesus taught orally. He, he primarily taught his apostles. And then the apostles were given the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the grace to go out and teach all nations. Making them disciples, okay? The apostolic kerygma, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus taught the, the apostles. He gave them a gift. He gave them a special charism or gift of the Holy Spirit that they could understand, as best a human can, what he taught and handed on faithfully to the people of God. Sacred tradition is the oral teaching of Jesus Christ given to the apostles who are united to the, to the head of the apostles, Peter, the Pope, in matters of faith and morals, okay? Sacred tradition, the oral teaching of Jesus. Now. Some of what Jesus taught, some of what Jesus taught orally was written down, okay, by the evangelists, by other apostolic men. 
Some of what Jesus taught orally was written down. That eventually ended up as the Bible, sacred scripture. Okay? So you see, there's two ways God transmitted truth to us. Number one, in an oral way, a spoken way. He taught the apostles, gave them a gift of the Holy Spirit to understand what he was saying so they could hand it on faithfully. So the oral teaching and the written teaching, they are equal in weight. They are equal in weight. Now that's Catholic teaching. Now I know some our Protestant brothers and sisters don't accept that. They say they don't have tradition. They have only scripture. You know, and they'll say it. Sola Scriptura. Only the scriptures. That's what they said. And then the response is, where in the scriptures does it say only the scriptures? <laughs> and it doesn't. It does not. Now, all of it is useful for teaching. And, and the Bible, <laughs> you know, we've got to love it and we've got to respect it and you've got to read it and you've got to pray it and you've got to live it. No question about it. But equal with the scriptures is sacred tradition. And, and the simple response, if I say, what is sacred tradition? Capital T. We don't mean mere custom. We're not talking about customs here. You know, customs like not eating meat on Friday, uh, you know, uh, going to Mass on, on, on holy days of obligation and Sundays. That's a precept. That's a precept. You have to do that. But what, when, with tradition, we're talking about divine revelation. How did God reveal himself to us? in the person of his son. Two essential ways, in an oral form and in a written form, and they, were, they are equal, equal in importance. That's Catholic teaching, and most Catholics don't know it. And so they can't defend their faith, they, they really can't live their faith totally, because they don't know that. Now, I did a series uh, that goes into this in, in more depth, it's called Word of God. Uh, it's a six-part series that takes the church's primary contemporary document on divine revelation. That, that document is called Dei Verbum, Word of God. Uh, it's one of the major documents of Vatican II. Uh, it's the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. If you want to learn how to properly read the Bible, if you want to know how to interpret the Word of God as the church does, which is the only authentic and authoritative way, Take a look at that series, Word of God, because it goes right into the document. There's six chapters in the document, and I do a, a lecture on each one of those six chapters. Word of God. Very important. So you've got sacred tradition. What is that? That is the oral teaching of Jesus Christ given to his apostles, who then handed it on to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome. So there you got the magisterium then, gets that oral teaching. That has equal weight with sacred scripture. You know what sacred scripture is, the Bible. Now, wherever you have a word, wherever you have a word, whether written or spoken, you must have an authentic and authoritative interpreter of that word. Otherwise, what you end up with is, well, if you have a thousand people looking at a word or words, you will end up with a thousand personal opinions. You know, this is what's wrong with a lot of the scripture studies that go on today. Now, scripture study is a great thing. I highly encourage it. Catholics must read the Bible. Our faith is based on the Bible. I highly encourage you to read the scriptures every day. You know, if you go to Mass, of course, we have the scriptures in Mass. Do this, but... You have to know how to read the scriptures. You know, there are principles that tell you how to read this. So if you have a word, written or spoken, somebody's got to tell you what it means authentically and authoritatively. That's the magisterium of the church. That's the magisterium's job. Who authentically and authoritatively interprets and teaches the one word of God, whether in a written or, or oral form, the church? the magisterium of the church. So, how does God transmit himself? How does God reveal himself to us in Jesus? But how do you know Jesus? Jesus comes to us in the written form, scripture, 
and in the oral form, the apostolic kerygma, sacred tradition. But you have to have an interpreter, that's the magisterium. So you've got sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium, the teaching of the magisterium. No one of those can subsist without the other two. I'll give you an analogy. We know that there is one God. Basic there, no rocket science. One God. We believe in one God. That one God is three divine persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Basic. Not confusing. Very simple. That's a mystery. We can't say we understand that fully, but we can say we believe that. It's a matter of faith. So, one God, three divine persons. As a matter of faith, we also know wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two must be. You can't separate God. So, uh, that's what we call in theology uh, the divine perichoresis or circumcession. You don't have to remember those words. Uh, you can if you, if you want to, you know, advance. But you don't. Remember the concept. Remember concepts. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two must be. Must be because of this strict unity of God. Now, as an analogy. Now remember that we're talking about God here. In theology, the object of study is God. Uh, theology concerns the study of God and all things as they relate to God. So, revelation, divine revelation. God is revealing himself to him. The one God. We have three elements. Inextricably united compenetrated scripture tradition magisterial teaching no one of those can exist without the other two now this is important is God is your concept of God correct if it isn't one God three divine persons no that's what it is that's a fact that's objective reality but you could say well Yes, but I don't believe that. Well, fine, you believe anything you want, but your belief will be out of accord with truth. Unless you believe that, because that's a fact. Oh, yes, but there are many religions. Indeed, there are, and they're not all right. Okay, I respect them all, but they are not all correct. The objective truth is that there is one God, and that one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That one God has revealed himself to us. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching. If, you're, if, God is, if you say God's only the Holy Spirit, can the Holy Spirit really be the Holy Spirit without the Father and the Son? No. No. You say only scripture. Can that be true? No. No. No one of those can subsist without the other two. It's a Trinitarian analogy. Tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. You say, oh, but scripture is all I want. Scripture is all I have. Okay, if that's all you have, you don't have scripture. You can't. You can't have scripture because no one of those can subsist without the other two. Well, well how, how can that be? Listen, there's three principles. Three principles. For understanding God's revelation, okay? Reading the Bible. Okay? Here's a Bible. Now this Bible has a lot of words in it. Right? All these words are synthesized, condensed, and distilled into one word. All this equals Jesus. All this equals Jesus Christ. That's the truth. He is the truth. Yeah, but who is Jesus? You might say. Who recognizes the face of Christ? Peter recognized Christ for who he was. The successors of Peter, the Pope. So the magisterium of the church recognizes and teaches the authentic and authoritative word of God. When I read the Bible, I have to read it with three principles operational. Otherwise, I can't truly read it authentically and authoritatively. The Word of God must be read as a totality. In other words, when you read the Bible, you cannot take things out of context. Otherwise, you can justify everything including murder. Oh yeah. 
Oh, we, we had it when I was down in Florida. There was, a, there was a, a, a minister down there who was justifying killing abortion doctors because it protected the innocent and, and used the Bible or tried to use the Bible to justify that. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you know, and you take an innocent life and your life will be taken. No, you can't take it out of context. You must read the Bible as a totality. That's the first principle. The second principle, you must read the written word of God in light of sacred tradition. If you don't have sacred tradition, if you don't know what it is or use it, how are you going to read the Bible in the light of that sacred tradition? You're not. You're going to make errors in your interpretation. And three, you must read the, word, the written word of God, the Bible, you must read it applying the analogy of the faith. You say, what's that? The analogy of the faith. Very simple. It's the body of doctrine which the faith has been given. The teaching of the church in faith and moral. Okay, let's say uh, somebody takes the Bible and they, they say, well, Jesus in the Bible uh, is inclusive. He, he loves everybody. He does. Absolutely. And therefore, uh, it's okay to live a homosexual lifestyle. And they'll use the Bible to justify that. Wrong, wrong, wrong. They're reading the written word of God not in the light of sacred tradition, and they're not applying the analogy of the faith, and they arrive at erroneous, fallacious conclusions. You can't do it. And they go, oh, you're bigoted. Nope, not bigoted. You're homophobic. Nope, not homophobic. Man, I've had a million conversations with homosexual persons. I love them. They are the children of God. And I'm not afraid of them. I tell them this. You and I are very much alike. And they say, oh. <laughs> no. No. You and I are very much alike because we're both called to celibacy. Now stop and think for a moment. Listen to what I just said. We're very much, I sympathize with your struggles. You're a child of God and God loves you. No question about that. And I've got to love you too. If God loves you, I've got to love you. I'm no better than God. Servant's no better than his master. Jesus loves them, and I have to love them, and you have to love them. But love is not confirming someone in their sins, taking the easy way out, patting them on the head and saying, you're okay, I'm okay. No, there's something wrong, something very wrong. This political correctness is the kiss of death to human dignity. And it's got to stop. So, you've got to know how to read the Bible. The, the people, they, they just don't get it. When you read the Word of God, once again, you have to read it as a totality. Don't take, don't take it out of context. Otherwise, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That means, hey, uh, you know, my, my, my relative got killed by someone in a drive-by shooting. I'm going to go out and kill the whole gang. You know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. No, that is not what the Bible says. You have to read it as a totality. And well, you're not sure what that totality is. That's why you have to read it in the light of sacred tradition. And you say, I don't know what sacred tradition is. I'm going to say it again. It's the oral teaching of Jesus Christ given to his apostles, who then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, handed on that teaching faithfully to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, as they teach faith and morals to the church. That's sacred tradition. The oral tradition, the written Bible, interpreted by the magisterium of the church. No one of those three can truly exist without the other two. There is no authentic Bible without tradition, and magisterial teaching. There is no authentic tradition without scripture 
and magisterial teaching. There can be no magisterium without scripture and tradition, just like there can't be a God unless he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? So, so that, that's the analogy, and that's the truth. That's how it works. Okay. The Word of God, remember, is a person. A person. The Word of God is Jesus. Uh, love your faith. Love the truth. Why? Because the truth, our faith, is Jesus Christ. And he is God. And the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. And then to love your neighbor as yourself out of love for God. That is the definition of the theological virtue of charity. You know, if I ask you, what is charity? You will say, well, charity is the theological virtue by we love God above all things for his own sake. And we love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. Not rocket science. Love God above all things. Not because of what he can do for us, but because of who he is. I love God above all things. Why? Because he's God. That's why. Not, not, not be, God is not a slot machine where you put in a few prayers and hope to hit a jackpot. <laughs> God's a lot more than that. We praise, worship, and adore God for his own sake. Okay, that's charity. I love God above all things for his own sake. And then I love my neighbor as myself out of love for God. It, it, you have to have all of that in place or you will not do it. One way to look at it is, first of all, I have to establish my relationship with God. You can call that the vertical dimension. Me? God. I've got to love God above all things. He's the creator. He's my father. Any good I have, every breath I take, because of God. Okay? The vertical dimension. That, then I've got to love my neighbor as my... I can't love you unless first I love God. Because in order to love you at all times and under all circumstances, I've got to have some grace. <laughs> and so do you, right? I mean, really, in order for us to love each other all the time, that requires grace. Where's the grace come from? God. So first, I've got to love God, and that establishes the vertical dimension. I love God, and then I can, I'm enabled, to love my neighbor as myself. That's the horizontal. So you've got the, the vertical and the horizontal. What, what do you have then? Cross. Then you've got a cross. That's what it comes down to. In order to love charity, caritas, agape love, you end up with a cross. You know, during Lent, we're moving towards Holy Week, moving towards the Paschal Mystery. How did Jesus save the world like that on a cross? That's what we get when we love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves. You'll get a cross. No cross, no crown. No pain, no gain. No goal, no glory. Good Friday precedes Easter Sunday every time. And so we're going to live that. We're going to live the cross. That's the way it is. Let me read to you the prologue from the uh, beautiful uh, document, the, the divine uh, constitution, uh, or rather the um, dogmatic constitution on divine revelation from Dei Verbum one of the primary 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. Hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith, this sacred synod, Vatican II, a search to the words of St. John who says, we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ following then in the steps of the councils Trent and Vatican I this council Vatican II wishes to set forth the true doctrine on divine revelation 
and its transmission, for it wants the whole world to hear the summons to salvation, so that through hearing it, it may believe. Through belief, it may hope, and through hope, it may come to love. And that's what we're dealing with here. This is extremely essential. As Catholics, we must know this and then live this. I'm going to give you a, a long-term homework assignment. Okay? It, 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 it may take the efforts of an entire lifetime uh, to achieve it, but it's not difficult. It is essential. And you can get it. Listen, please don't think that you're not educated enough or intelligent enough to get this. Take it from me. Please believe me. You are. You are intelligent enough. You are educated enough. And you say, but I don't have any education. Neither did the poor fishermen in Galilee. You have a brain that God has given to you. Uh, you, you have free will which God has given to us. Those are the two greatest gifts, intellect and will. Use them, use them to learn your faith and to live your faith. Now this, the battle we're talking about here, the, this battle for truth, the, the victory is dependent largely on this. You have to do it one at a time. A lot of people, at least subconsciously, leave important things to others. And they think somehow they're exempt from, oh, somebody else will do it. You know, that's the underlying, the subconscious um, uh, presupposition they have. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's like an old nun said to me one time before I was ordained. Uh, she said, if you don't do it, who will? And, and you know, God was speaking through her. I, I know it. She, she was a very holy um, Carmelite prioress. And, and she said to me, I was a deacon at the time, about to be ordained a priest. And she said, if you don't do it, who do you think will? In other words, the buck stops here. Every one of us has to come to this. It's not just priests. Not just priests. Not just bishops. Every single one of us. Every baptized person has a mandate from Christ. To be, in a certain sense, priest, prophet, and king. We have to live out the life of Jesus Christ. We all have to absorb Jesus, become one with him. It's a, it's a mystical marriage. The two become one. Jesus and the soul become one. Uh, it, it's like uh, what, what, what Jesus said to Peter. Um, it, it, when you speak, it's me speaking through you. Well, whatever you hold bound on earth will be held bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The church has that, that power. You have, in a certain sense, through your baptism, you have a great power. You have a great power to save your soul or lose it. And you also have great power, through the grace of God, to help others save their souls or lose their souls. Let me tell you something. No one goes alone. No one goes up or down alone. We all go taking a host with us. Your life has influence on other people. Your decisions have influence on other people. Parents have influence on their children. Children, you have influence on your parents, on your friends, on your teachers. Everyone has influence on other human beings. In virtue of our life, we make a statement. We make a, an, an eloquent statement by our life. Two ways, the Bible says, two ways are set before you, O man. The way of life and the way of death. The way of truth and the way of lies. The way of good and the way of evil. God's way, the devil's way. Two ways are set before you, O man. The way of life and the way of death. Therefore, choose life. In other words, get it right. Do the right thing. Learn your faith. You have something to build on. You know your faith. You, you know the basics of it. You know the essence of it. Now build on that. 
Learn it more. Listen, take a few minutes every day to, to pray, read the Bible, read the catechism. You know, the means of social communication have been given to us as a gift from God. Now, in a sense, they're neutral. Uh, books, television, radio, the internet. These are tools, weapons, means. They can be used for good or for evil, for truth or for lies, for life or for death. Uh, the things in themselves are neutral. I learned a long time ago that we, well, the, the church told me and my superior told me, we have to use the means of social communication and that's what you will do in your life. We have to preach the gospel by using the means available. Let me tell you something. I can come here and talk to a couple thousand people and that's a good thing to do. But I can also go on television with less effort and talk to tens of millions of people. Boom, just like that. And that's what we do. You know, my shows go to over 110 nations all over the country. I'm on radio all over the world, shortwave radio, uh, Catholic radio in the United States is increasing by leaps and bounds. I can't go any place anymore without being recognized. We have to do that. The internet. Listen, if you've resisted the computer generation as I did, you know, I feel, oh, I'm an old guy, you know, I'm old school. I, I don't want to bother, you know, hey, you know, I, I get around okay. Baloney, man. Once I got computer literate and, and, and my people, you know, my goddaughter who was my office manager and, and her husband now who, who works with us, um, they pushed me and pushed me. You've got to get a website. I am a priest. What do I need a website for, you know? Um, got to get a website. Got to get a website. So I got a website. And, um, you know, I was worried about, gee, how am I going to pay for it, you know? Uh, cost thirty thousand dollars to have it designed and do it right and so forth oh you know the older you get the tighter you get you know <laughs> i don't know if you've noticed that but I, that, that's the case with me anyway you know man i'm tight with a nickel and, and, I, and I oh I, I i just don't want to do that i can't afford that i can't do that oh you got to do it anyway well we have over a hundred thousand now, now listen, you know the average parish might have a thousand, well, not even, 500 families, 600 families. You know, you might have, if they're going to church, you might have a thousand people, 2,000 people active in a parish, right? Over 100,000 people a week come to my website. Now, you'd be hard put to find a parish with 100,000 folks. They wouldn't be coming if I didn't have it. They wouldn't be coming if I didn't have it, and they wouldn't be getting the teaching unless we made it available on television, radio, internet, books, CDs, DVDs. We do that all. Why? Why? Do we do that all because we like, uh, you know, being in business, selling stuff? No. We do it to spread the gospel. If we don't do that, the God, we won't be doing our part. I would rightly consider myself negligent derelict in my duties if I did not fully use the means of social communication to get the truth out to the people. But because we're doing that, I'll tell you the way I look at it. I, I'm very military in my orientation. You know, somebody, I'm, I'm even wearing black BDUs. You know what BDUs are? <laughs> BDUs, battle dress uniform. The, the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, when I gave my, my series, uh, uh, Surrender is Not an Option, uh, I, I came attired in BDUs. And he said, Father, you're wearing army clothes. I said, that's right, Bishop. When I come to a battle zone, I'm ready. <laughs> that's it, man. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but we got a battle. It's a spiritual battle against the forces of evil, the fallen angels. That's who we're fighting. Like St. Paul said, I believe St. Paul. You've got to believe St. Paul too. It's necessary. That's the word of God. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That, 
those are choirs of angels, fallen angels. Against the rulers of this present age of darkness, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in regions above, therefore put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Take the shield of faith and the two-edged sword of the word of God. Go forth into battle. Fight the good fight, run the race to the finish line. And then, my friend, then I promise you, you'll stand before Almighty God and you'll hear these beautiful words. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. Yeah.